It's uh, my pleasure today to uh, welcome Ned Patton. Um, I guess most of you probably know him quite well. Uh, Ned works at uh, MCubed. He's a project scientist over there. Uh, his specialty, boundary layer meteorology, and turbulence, turbulence uh, resolving numerical uh, models. Um, let me give you a little bit about uh, background. Um, he got his um, bachelor and his uh, PhD at uh, UC Davis. Um, his thesis title of uh, PhD was a large eddy, eddy simulation of turbulent flow above and within the plant canopy. That's a nice picture of it, actually. Um, after his PhD, Annette uh, had a stint at the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate of the University of Minnesota. And he was a supercomputing fellow uh, at the Minnesota Supercomputing uh, Institute at the university. And in uh, 2000, he joined MCubed and has been there ever since. So I hope it's been a very good stay. Well, I was actually here the whole time, but I worked there. Uh, it's one of those, I know. Yeah, I just, <laughs> that's the official uh, uh, affiliation. Ned has uh, authored and co-authored over uh, 40 uh, peer-reviewed publications and uh, given a lot of uh, conference presentations. And uh, I'm really looking forward for his seminar today. Uh, biosphere Atmosphere Exchange, Insights from Measurements and Models. That please. Well, folks, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, and so I'd like to uh, talk to you today about uh, a what I would call a life's work uh, thus far um, and sort of take you, I presume not everybody in the audience is going to uh, understand the details at the end, but I hopefully can bring you up, uh, up to speed throughout uh, so that uh, I will tell you where we are, what we know, and what we're working on currently, and how we think it uh, needs to, uh, how these processes need to be included in our larger scale models. So first, I want to thank uh, many of my collaborators along the way. Uh, and somebody's name is missing, apparently. Um, but uh, that uh, this is not all work done by myself, but work that is uh, integrated uh, across a number of folks. Uh, and especially wanted to thank the NCARIO uh, staff that's helped me with a number of the field campaigns that we have conducted over the years. Uh, and uh, a picture of one of our towers from an aircraft uh, down in, in, in Alabama. So why do we care about plant canopies? Uh, plant canopies are uh, extremely important. Uh, they cover about 30% of the Earth's land surface. Uh, so they, are, uh, they, they, uh, they come in very uh, different. Uh, they're comprised quite differently in terms of they can be uh, irrigated crops all the way up to uh, you know, you know, uh, tropical rainforests and or up to uh, temperate rainforest, so they have widely varying character. Uh, they're extremely efficient at transporting moisture from deep in the soil uh, to uh, make it available to the atmosphere for, for rain, uh, to make rain. Uh, and so they, it's much more efficient than is evaporation from the soil surface. So they're actually a really important source of moisture uh, for our atmosphere. And they're also the prime uh, sink for CO2 uh, that we are emitting daily. and uh, they emit a number of reactive gases that control uh, the uh, oxidative c c capacity of, of, of the atmosphere. So uh, processes uh, transporting these, uh, s these entities to and from the vegetation is a really important piece of our uh, large-scale modeling efforts uh, to get uh, to improve our pr predictive skill both for weather and for climate. Um, it's also important for agricultural purposes in terms of dealing uh, and understanding crop damage and or people applying sprays to their crops, et cetera. So it's really uh, an, an important piece of our fluid mechanical understanding that we're working towards uh, uh, towards improving our, our understanding. And uh, in that same light, the military uh, also is interested in these things uh, for uh, building simple models to get their troops out of the way if something was, uh, was awry uh, or if somebody were to admit something that they didn't like. So these are uh, parts of the applications of the style work that we're working on here. <laughs> 
But uh, to speak to you a little bit about uh, the global modeling side of things, we uh, now have uh, long-term measurements uh, that are capable of uh, explaining and or sampling uh, the Earth's uh, uh, emissions of heat and or moisture from uh, from the surface uh, and we use models to get at that and we also know that we have very uh, bias we have strong biases in the models uh, that are typically connected with regions of uh, tall forests so if you look um, if you look here uh, you can see oops sorry uh, if you look here, you can see that in the tropics uh, we are uh, we have some biases as well as uh, up in the uh, temperate areas up in the uh, towards uh, up up in the northern reaches of Russia uh, compared to uh, what the uh, a year long simulation uh, inside of CESM uh, would otherwise uh, produce. So how does CESM do this? Uh, they have a, lots, basically they're trying to account for all the processes at the surface. Uh, the piece that I'm gonna to, to talk about today is more uh, this piece on the upper left hand corner looking at the exchanges of heat and moisture uh, with, the, uh, with the vegetated surfaces. Uh, so if we focus in here, um, these models uh, are quite simple. They have a simple big leaf re representation of the uh, of the canopy as a whole. They uh, deal with di different streams of radiation. Uh, they have roots that can tap into the soil to to grab hold of uh, the moisture deeper in the soils. Uh, one of the things they have to assume is that the water vapor and temperature profiles are constant through the uh, canopies. They assume uh, that the, the winds at the surface are related to use are basically the friction velocity, the momentum sink at the top of the trees, uh, and they represent these by various uh, physiological uh, representations of a deciduous tree, a pine tree, a corn crop, a uh, some other type of uh, vegetation. But the piece that I'm gonna work with mostly today uh, is the turbulence and how the atmosphere communicates with these trees uh, and how we, uh, what the assumptions are that go in with that. Uh, and we typically assume, and we know that near the surface, that the uh, the wind stress, the uh, turbulent momentum flux towards the ground is nearly constant with height. And through that assumption, uh, we can come up with what's uh, known as the the, the log law. Uh, and so it relates basically uh, the velocity profile to uh, the momentum stress u star uh, at the uh, at the surface. And so that's if there's no trees and if the basically the large scale models take that uh, understanding and physically just shift the mean momentum sink up to some physical height uh, in <laughs> in the trees uh, through a displacement height uh, so they don't change the fluid mechanics they don't change anything but physically shifting uh, the uh, the height at which the momentum is absorbed uh, to some place uh, in the middle of the canopy um, and I hope uh, today I can <laughs> convince you that that is uh, not true and that we actually uh, know that the wind profiles are quite uh, distinct from that. It is nearly logarithmic aloft, uh, but that there are connections between uh, the regions inside the canopy and those aloft that, that make uh, those relationships between a flux and a gradient quite distinct. So just for some observational uh, evidence of this, so these are vertical profiles uh, taken above a eucalypt forest uh, at a range of stability. So this is uh, a measure of, of the stability. Uh, and the dash lines are what you would expect uh, if you were to apply in a displaced monohobikov like form uh, or a logarithmic law, but taking into account uh, the influence of, of <laughs> atmospheric st stability through uh, a monohobikov like uh, modification. But the point is that you can see with the black lines, which are the observations, uh, that there is a distinctly smaller gradient to 
for the same flux. And that is a unique uh, aspect of, of uh, plant canopies. Uh, same is true for the p p potential temperature. It's just that the sign is different. Uh, but that basically we have known for some time that Mononokhobokov similarity theory and direct application of log laws do not uh, apply over uh, tall canopies. Why is that? What's different? What, what do we know is different? So if you were to take a sonic anemometer and place it well up above the trees at, uh, I don't know, three, four times the height of the trees up in the surface layer and look at a time trace of the fluctuations. So this is, this is the time evolution of the vertical velocity and the streamwise velocity. You can see that there, there is a correlation uh, between the two, uh, but that uh, there's only a weak uh, bias towards ejections, uh, but that it is distinct from what you find if you actually put a sonic anemometer down at the top of the trees where you can see uh, organization in the flow. You can see that it's uh, heavily biased towards weak ejections with uh, intermittently occurring strong sweeping events. So this is downward, so downward moving uh, fluid bringing high momentum fluid down into to the trees versus slow moving fluid being ejected out of the trees at the top. Uh, and so there's a distinct difference between what happens well above the trees to what happens right at the top of the trees uh, from uh, these sorts of measurements. Other evidence for the differences in plant canopies uh, stems from some work here where vertical profiles of the temperature, so as canopies absorb radiation vertically uh, at the top of the trees more because they see, uh, the, the, see the sky more than uh, the leaves down below, so you end up with a relative warming of the atmosphere at elevated regions uh, and a, uh, but that the, it's relatively cool down in in inside the subcanopy, but yet, given that profile, uh, you would expect uh, that the flux would be downward, uh, and yet we still see upward fluxes at uh, in regions where the gradient is counter to uh, what you might expect. So you can't use a flux gradient relationship that assumes downward uh, down gradient uh, transfer. Uh, so this was a, another piece of evidence showing that canopies are different uh, in some way. Um, and it, so if you take, these are time traces of temperature uh, at multiple levels on uh, on a tower uh, where H is the height of the trees, so I'll use that throughout. And so H is the height of the trees, so this, this sensor is at the top of the trees and these are down inside the trees and these up here are well above the trees, almost to three times the height of the trees. And you can see uh, that there are coherent, uh, so weak, weak warming terminated by sharp cooling uh, that is coherent throughout the depth of these uh, sensors. So there's uh, whatever, six of, of the sensors, and you can see that there's organization in this flow that's different uh, than what you would see uh, at uh, levels high above. All right, but there's something unique about this system. So if you take uh, every one of these events, uh, every one of these fronts, these sharp fronts in the temperature, the, the cooling uh, process, and concatenate many of them just to kind of get a feel for what the average uh, structure or the organization in the flow m might look like, uh, we, we can see here, so this is, an average of many of those ramp-like structures uh, where we keyed on uh, that at the canopy top is the center, so that's time zero, and these are things happening before versus things happening later uh, than that time at the top of the trees. So you can see that in concatenating both the temperature field and, and the velocity field uh, that you see this sloping microfront of the temperature that uh, persists throughout depth, but that associated with that there's this weak rising motion ahead of the front and the strong uh, flushing of the canopy layers uh, associated with this uh, what we call a sweeping event. So bringing relatively cool so that's these dashed lines uh, here, relatively cool air down into the trees uh, while relatively warm air is bring, being ejected out in front of these uh, events. So these, these have been shown to be on the order of 60 or two, uh, these, these organized 
organized structures have been shown to account for about 60 to 80 percent of the total exchange. Folks might, uh, there's been definitely a debate about that, those numbers, but there's no question about their existence and their importance. It's just a matter of how, how important are they, but they're a big piece of the transfer of material and energy between uh, the canopy layers and those aloft. Uh, the problem is with all of this is that all this is being done with a single tower. We know a little bit about uh, its spatial evolution through using t -t 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 Taylor's hypothesis, which we actually know is not quite valid in inside the canopies, but it's really difficult to know where the tower is relative to these eddy motions and how they are evolving, what the, what what state are they in as they're passing by the tower. Uh, so. Uh, back in my PhD days, we started using numerical simulation, three-dimensional uh, calculations trying to uh, get at the influence of canopies and or trying to use these tools to get at what those, what the character characteristic motions are. Uh, here we're showing slices. This is just the time evolution of a slice of a passive scalar that's being emitted by the trees in, in the bottom of the panel, and a time evolution of the vertical velocity field uh, here. And if you recall, in the previous slide, you saw that there were weak ejections and sharp downwelling motions all occurring at one place, and we theorized that uh, that would make for high pressure, uh, a region of convergence. And so we took all of my numerical data like this, and we looked, uh, we, we take a slice at the top of the trees, and we look for a peak in the pressure field. We drive around in time and space looking for where that uh, pressure is at a maximum, and concatenate spatially all of these, basically 3,000 of these events happening at the top of the trees to see what the average structure might, might, might look like. So using that strategy, here's an example of that. Uh, the green line, uh, remember I don't concatenate on the uh, on the microfront, in any sense here, we're using just the pressure field, and naturally uh, we we get a we, we we find the sharpest gradient in the scalar right in between. Uh, this red is the sweep event, and the yellow is the ejection event. And the blue is a visualization of a vortex core. So it's using a lambda two analysis, looking at the uh, the second eigenvalue of the uh, uh, the, the square of the symmetric and anti-symmetric portions of the uh, velocity gradient tensor, if you really want to know. But uh, the point is, we're able to induce what the three-dimensional structure looks like now in an average sense. So we can see that if I change this, I just chose a random uh, value of this lambda 2, which is this uh, second eigenvalue. Uh, and if I were to uh, drop that, uh, you would find that this is actually a combination of a head down and a head up hairpin. Uh, so this is a hairpin vortex that has a, uh, a set of legs that are, that are up here and they're sweeping down in. So the sweeping motions are happening between these two legs and then in the, on the head up side, the ejections are happening between the two. So this is this point of convergence uh, between these. But you can, see, you can from this learn a little bit about their horizontal scale. You can say that they're ordered two times the height of the trees and they're in, in their in their uh, width um, and learn a little bit about sort of their character. Uh, and so what, what's important though is that these are quite different from what you see over smooth uh, smooth walls where you would expect, expect a logarithmic uh, profile where for measurements in a wind tunnel we know that these are typically head up hairpins most of the time. Uh, and this is, this is ejecting the slow moving fluid from the surface uh, out to uh, outer layers. So very distinct eddy structures. Um, and what's different? Why are they different? And we think it's tied to uh, the fact that there's the shear layer at the top of the trees, where there's slow moving fluid above. Uh, below fast moving fluid, uh, and from uh, from the engineering uh, communities, uh, we know that that should produce uh, vortices of this sort. Um, so. We, we put forward a, a hypothesis back uh, a few years ago that we think we know how, what the process is by which these eddies are formed. So 
It's all tied to this inflection point at the top of the trees where we have fast moving fluid above slow moving fluid as the uh, canopy absorbs momentum through a, through a vertically distributed depth. Uh, that large boundary layer scales of motion come bring high momentum fluid down to the top of the trees and uh, speed up the airflow at the top of the trees just to kick off a train of these events, depending on how long that uh, that inflection is ex is accentuated, uh, that the initial instability is is a Kelvin Helmholtz wave uh, that is itself unstable, forming into uh, two dimensional Stewart vortices that are unstable to perturbations in their own right, uh, and through a helical, through basically Pierre and Baron, uh, Widenall's uh, helical pairing instability, uh, are attracted to each other and form into what we see as these head up and combinations of head up and head down hairpins. Uh, so it's this sort of cascade of instability processes that we think are re responsible for generating uh, these, these eddy-like structures and that they're characteristic is really tied to uh, the vorticity thickness at the top of the trees. So it's basically at that sh shear layer, how if the canopy is really dense through the top and the flow can never penetrate, the vorticity thickness is quite small. If they're a, l a little more sparse, they can actually grow to be the depth of the canopy or more. Uh, and so they are, you know, it's really dependent on how deep those shear driven eddies can penetrate to uh, and through, through, through the vegetation. Uh, so Therefore, that introduces a new length scale. And using this length scale, um, uh, we can, uh, colleagues of mine have taken this length scale. So this length scale, uh, delta omega, which is this vorticity thickness, have uh, taken the traditional uh, Monokovikov logarithmic forms, modified them for uh, introducing this new uh, length scale associated with this vorticity thickness at the top of the trees, uh, matching that with an exponential decay inside of the canopy, because that we know is how the canopy drag operates inside the canopy. There's some canopy uh, parameters here that are related to the physical elements and their efficiency at extracting the momentum. Uh, but uh, What's nice about this formulation uh, is that we don't ever have to actually specify the height through which the canopy is impacting the flow aloft. Uh, it actually naturally transitions back to MO cleanly. It makes it very, uh, I'll use the word again, clean to implement inside of our models that we are all already using. Uh, and so, but before we do that, I wanted to show you that now, for, so this is three different uh, canopies of three different uh, densities. So moving from a leaf area index, which is the vertical integral of all of the canopy elements, uh, their frontal area, uh, and moving from a relatively less dense forest to a relatively dense forest. And the blue is observations, and the red is what you would expect from a displaced version of, of uh, Monin Obikov. Uh, and so you can see that we are actually able to now match the measurements quite quite nicely across a range of uh, canopy densities. So it's really, we think we have the physics somewhat explained. We think we understand a piece of the puzzle. Uh, and so I've taken this and actually implemented it in an offline version of the climate models, uh, land surface models, CLM. Um, so uh, the observations here are in blue. So these are what you're looking at here. I'm driving CLM with observations from FluxNet or Meriflux data sets. Uh, I'm taking an entire month of the growing season of July, uh, and I'm looking at an average diurnal cycle, driving the model with observations to produce a flux where we've actually measured the flux. So these are comparisons uh, directly uh, using the, so this is not a coupled thing, this is just uh, driving the land surface model with observations. Um, 
The reason it's called SPA as opposed to CLM is because this is actually the newer version of CLM that is not released yet, so it's actually uh, what will become a part of CLM5 uh, that's coming out shortly. Uh, the SPA piece, but the RSL, the roughness sublayer component, the depth, you know, the bringing in the canopy influence has not yet been implemented in what's going to be delivered. But the point is that we're now, if you look at the comparisons between uh, the red and the blue versus the green and the blue, you can see that we've uh, done, we're doing doing a much better job matching uh, the, uh, the observed fluxes uh, by simply making a change that accounts for the physics and the, uh, the change that the canopy has made to the physics and also made substantial improvements in the momentum sink uh, at the surface. So the problem with this is that the theory hinges solely on there being shear at the top of the trees. So this is really tied to times when the wind is blowing. There are times we know that there's calm winds uh, and that uh, there's still substantial exchange vertically through convective uh, motions. So we are now moving trying to move into a new realm of trying to understand the influence of stability on uh, the canopy exchange. And I'll explain to you where we are with all that here. So for all this, I'm using, uh, I've been involved in three different field campaigns that were EOL supported. Uh, the, there were uh, the canopy horizontal array turbulence study uh, back in 2007, which uh, Don and I led, uh, and uh, the Manitou Experimental Forest, which was a long-term record trying to look at seasonal influences in a ponderosa pine forest, so completely different from uh, a horizontally homogeneous uh, walnut orchard that was the first experiment. Uh, and then we were involved in the Southern Occident Aerosol Study, uh, which had a completely different sort of primary focus, but I wanted to make sure we didn't miss uh, the canopy pieces uh, associated with that. And one of the key pieces that came out of that is we had a lot of, for, for a month and a half, we had very weak winds. So we have a lot of range of stability to work with uh, that we did not have so much in chats. Uh, but I apologize. T t today I'm going to spend most of my time uh, t talking about the chats data. And in concert with that, I want to talk to you a little bit about large eddy simulation because we're using a combination of the two. I'm not going to go into the details of how we do everything, but I just want you to know that it's become somewhat of a direct complement to observations where we can actually simulate the atmosphere with enough fidelity that we can ask science questions using the numerical simulation uh, in ways that we could not otherwise uh, do with just s single tower measurements. Um, but for the case that I'm looking at here, we've we use this for flow over waterways, we use this for flow uh, ocean mixing in the ocean, flow over hills, kind, 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 kinds of questions. But uh, for today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we introduce trees uh, into uh, the numerical model. So placing the equations on a discrete grid is an implicit filter. We actually do explicit filtering of the equations as well because we use a spectral method to solve the equations. So we actually tr truncate the top one-third wave numbers. But in doing so, there are terms in the equations that, 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 are, that remain that represent the presence of the canopy elements uh, because of the, that process of filtering and the differentiation do not commute in the presence of uh, quantities that are not constant around the elements. So uh, if you think about airflow impinging on a wall uh, or on a post, there will be high pressure on the front side of the post, low pressure on the back side of the post. So it's not constant if you were to be at a fixed location. So that's how these terms remain in the equations. Uh, and we model the pressure piece of that and the viscous piece of that uh, with a drag force of this sort. Uh, but unique to our tools is that we've now uh, implemented a canopy model to deal with the exchange of heat and moisture between uh, uh, the trees. So. I've taken the NOAA land surface model, which is at the base of Wharf. Uh, we've been using that model uh, to look and ask heterogeneity quite, quite, quite questions in the past. Uh, but I've taken their single big leaf and vertically extended it through uh, a number of grid points. And that's a specifiable thing, the configurable thing. Uh, so you can see that there's multiple grid points that 
span up into the trees and, and represent uh, basically into those grid boxes. I know what the winds are, I know what the temperatures are of the atmosphere. I pass those into the land surface model and I solve a leaf energy balance at every one of those grid points so that I can then, in a coupled sense, have the source of heat and moisture uh, that looks uh, like this uh, be relative to a leaf temperature and the atmospheric temperature and bringing in the model control. Uh, basically, the trees are living, breathing entities inside of the code that are a single column. So they implement one of these at every horizontal grid point in the domain, and it's like a living, breathing forest canopy underneath and interacting with the atmosphere inside it. Uh, so uh, coming, so all I need to give it is basically a little bit of the character of the canopy itself, uh, the canopy element uh, distribution, a percentage of uh, leaves that are uh, that are uh, sunlit or shaded, uh, and a little bit about their uh, their ability to uh, control their uh, exchange of heat and moisture between their leaves through photosynthesis. But they have uh, access to a single set of roots inside the trees, uh, inside the ground. So it's it's basically taking advantage of NOAA's so, so, all of the soil model that's in NOAA, but vertically extending the leaf energy balance to multiple levels through the domain so we can actually look and ask a bunch of questions about uh, the linkages between the canopy and, and the turbulence. So these are uh, the simulations I'll be talking about are run on uh, the, some of them are run here on, on the Yellowstone, some of them are run on DOE machines. They are 2048 squared by 1,024 uh, grid points. We are operating on uh, more than 16,000 CPUs at once. Uh, so these are fairly large calc, cal calculations, but the idea is that we're trying to, re to resolve the boundary layer as a whole, so five kilometers in the horizontal domain, two in the vertical, uh, at a resolution where we can actually still see the trees, so two meter resolution uh, allowing us to see the vertical variation uh, in the canopy as well as its horizontal variation if we wanted, but here it's horizontally homogeneous. Um, uh, impose a constant forcing uh, from the sun uh, and an initial temperature and moisture profile uh, and ultimately at the end of the simulations the, ca the capping inversions are on the order of one kilometer. But the primary variation we're, we're operating here is we're actually looking at, we're changing the geostrophic forcing. So basically the winds aloft uh, change from uh, 20 meters a second, uh, all the way down to actual free convection of zero meters per second uh, through a, a regular fashion uh, so that we can investigate in a variation in stability uh, ranging from minus one to uh, minus infinity. So near neutral conditions where the wind and uh, shear is most important versus uh, free convection where there's absolutely no mean wind uh, and that we still know uh, turbulent exchange is important, yes. Horizontally homogeneous, but there's but they are individual grid points, and they are all interacting with different atmosphere at all times and responding. So they all start with the same soil moisture. They all see the same solar forcing, but the atmospheric interaction is varying in space and time. All right. Any other questions? So uh, I apologize, uh, I didn't have time to replot our chats data in the same format because we've learned a lot since, uh, since we published this. So this is actually from our paper in 2012. I just wanted to show you that in character, uh, the results from the numerical simulation are quite similar. Uh, up in the top uh, panels, the, the left three, uh, they're all normalized by their values at the top of the trees as opposed to by uh, what I've been normalizing by lately is a mixed 
scaling velocity that combines buoyancy and shear uh, so that we can actually look at the variation uh, in a more clean fashion. So I need to go back and replot the chat state in this way. I just didn't have time to do that before this talk. So but the point is uh, the wind profiles are match quite nicely to what you might see uh, at chats. Uh, if you normalized each of these by their value at the top of the trees, you can see that they would all collapse uh, and have a similar shape inside the canopy. Uh, and that the vertical velocity uh, variance is the same thing, uh, that they, if you take this, the, this left uh, set of three uh, and normalize them by their value at the top, you can see that they would actually be f uh, larger aloft, just like you see uh, in the dashed ones here. But importantly is that the third, third order moments, so the fluctuations in their, uh, their skewness, uh, so their deviations from Gaussianity, uh, match quite nicely in terms of what you would expect from outside. So we're actually getting, uh, as far as the third moments uh, of the turbulence looking quite quite natural. But the point is now we can actually, now that we know things look fairly real, we can go ask some questions with these data sets that we couldn't do otherwise. So this is just an example of a slice of the vertical velocity, a horizontal slice at uh, up at 120 meters. So uh, in the surface layer, uh, just above, just to uh, show you what the character of the large scale flow is and the resolution that we have. So this is vertical velocity. So white is rising motion versus dark is the sinking motion. Uh, and you can see that through a range of stability. So this is weakly unstable to strongly unstable. So this is stronger importance of buoyancy here versus stronger importance of shear here that the character of the turbulence of the large scales changes uh, dramatically uh, across this, uh, uh, this regime. So we'd like to ask a question or we hypothesize that the evolution of these ABL structures uh, modulates and uh, impacts the processes controlling canopy exchange down at the top of the trees. So uh, we'll go into that a little bit here. So still frames, uh, this is, so the left side here is the near neutral case and the right side is the free convection case. Uh, so this is, as close to no buoyancy influences as as, as we have uh, versus free convection here. And you can see again that character. Uh, this is what you were looking at before. But in uh, the streamwise velocity, you can see that at this, at this height, so this is again still up at uh, six times the height of the trees, uh, that there's a highly skewed distribution, uh, that there's high momentum, uh, fast moving uh, fluid uh, in the regions of downwelling uh, areas here, and vice versa. Uh, that regions that in regions of upwelling motion uh, that there's uh, going to be taking the low momentum fluid from below upward um, and so you can see that uh, is the case for everywhere but now if we take this and look down at the top of the trees so now we're taking a slice right at the top of the trees uh, you can still see signature of those large scale structures uh, impacting uh, the flow at the top of the trees. And it, most importantly, as you can see, the, uh, the high momentum fluid, so all of the white, is fairly concentrated in those regions of downwelling motion. So it's bringing high momentum fluid down to the top of the trees. Uh, these, these are regions where we expect to see those shear-driven instabilities dominating. Uh, but in free convection, what does that, how does that look? So we, if you think about the large convective cells, there's gonna be regions where there's downwelling motion uh, and a sense of divergence down at the top of the trees, a sense of convergence at the other side of those cells and regions of shear between them. Um, so we're working on sort of, dict you know, looking at how that uh, impacts things. But the point is, even in the vertical velocity field that is typically uh, assumed to diminish uh, with, in scale with, with a height above the wall, so as you as you as you get c closer and c closer to the surface, that those scales should get smaller and smaller. We see that, but we also see uh, the, the filamentary structure of the buoyancy field uh, modulating that uh, in in this uh, in the free convection case. So 
to get at some of the character of that, we, these are two-dimensional spectra. So this is looking at the energy content at individual wave numbers, so how much energy is in that uh, turbulent motion. Um, and at, these are at uh, five different heights. So the black line is 10 times the height of the trees. Uh, six times the height of the trees is what we were looking at in those, those, uh, those slices. Uh, down to twice the height of the trees, the blue is the canopy top. And then the orange is, is deep inside the canopy halfway through. Um, and so if we start with a near neutral case, you can see that we, uh, we have a near minus 5 thirds, uh, as you might expect, well above uh, the trees. But that as you start to approach the trees, you start to see this enhancement uh, in the energy at scales more related to the canopy scale itself. So this is, this is that generation of canopy scale motions manifesting itself uh, in, in spectra. Um, and that you, as you enter into the canopy, that the shape of those spectra don't change much, but they just, they simply diminish in amplitude. Uh, but over for, for the vertical velocity field, uh, you can see that approach with the wall changing the large scales, uh, but that you also see this uh, enhancement of the vertical, of the energy at scales associated with uh, the canopy scales down here uh, at the fine scale. So this, this, this axis aloft is normalized by canopy height. So this is wave number by canopy height. The axis on the bottom is wave number multiplied by uh, the boundary layer depth. So you can get a feel for where these, uh, these spectra live. Uh, but if we move to free convection, one of the unique findings of this study has been that you see large scales all the way down inside the trees, down at five, you know, at at ten meters, uh, you can see evidence of the large scales of motion uh, all the way through, all the way down to five. And it's not that that novel, but it's more. It's the first time we've been able to quantify that. Um, but that there's uh, the other thing that's unique is that you don't see that enhancement of uh, the energy in the streamwise or the vertical velocity fields uh, to the degree that you did uh, in the shear dome case. Uh, so what does this mean for length scales in the flow? So these are integral length scales. So if you look at one single point and you look at how a fluctuation in the wind field, how it, it is correlated with fluctuations at distances away from you. So you're getting it sort of the integral scale of uh, the turbulence. Uh, you can see that stability. So the near neutral case is uh, here in uh, solid versus the free convection in the dashed. At canopy top, uh, the integral scales are on the order of two or three times the height of the trees. That's uh, what we're looking at here for streamwise velocity but that for vertical velocity, they're quite constant with height. This is really important for modeling uh, and or parameterizations of canopy exchange, because now we know uh, we can actually show, we, we, we've spent a lot of time looking at time based integral scales, and this is actually a spatially based integral scale uh, that has the influence of both the large scales and the small scales in it. So if you look at the U field, uh, the length scales for U, and uh, you can see that they rapidly increase with height as you depart from the canopy, and that's evidence of those large scale rolls uh, that have those long length scales in them all the way out uh, th across the whole domain. Uh, so uh, this is really uh, a fundamental difference uh, between uh, what you might expect over uh, smooth walls. All right. So recently, uh, some colleagues of mine put forward a paper looking at the correlation of fluxes. So if you take a flux of one quantity and look at how it's correlated with the flux of another quantity, so for here, this is momentum uh, and heat versus momentum and moisture. Uh, and they showed that with increasingly unstable conditions, that the fluxes of momentum and heat decorrelate, so it becomes, uh, they, 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 something must be changing, something's different in the flow that makes the momentum exchange hap happen differently than the exchange for heat and moisture. Uh, and therefore reactive gases. Uh, at CHATS, we looked at this for moisture. And so if you just ignore the blue and the green lines for now, uh, you can see that uh, from a transition from a near neutral case to a, uh, tr to a more buoyantly dominant case, so from black to red to orange, uh, that that 
correlation does get smaller, but that it actually doesn't vary with height. And that was something that we found, and that was one of the points of uh, this plot in the paper, is that we found that this, this feature is height independent above the trees. If we look at the same uh, quantities from the LES code, you can see we have a similar response. We can see a diminishing in the correlation between the momentum and heat flux as we go from uh, near neutral here in black down to uh, free convection in uh, the dashed line there, or dotted line there. Uh, and again, largely independent of height, how this occurs um, for similar response for moisture, but that we can also now look at relationships between moisture and heat, are they being transported by the same eddies or by the same 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 same, uh, same structures? And you can see that uh, they're highly co 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 correlated, but they actually remain highly, highly co 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 correlated throughout. So what causes this? So if we look, so in gray, I'm looking at a low-pass filtered vertical velocity slice at that same height of six times the height of the trees. So it's just the large-scale flow. We're just looking at the large boundary layer scales of motion, and uh, and just the large scales are left in, in the plot. But then if you look at the colors, the colors are representing uh, this basically a quadrant analysis of the fluxes. So when vertical velocity is upward and uh, Streamwise momentum is down or is, is negative, and so these are u you know u minus and u plus uh, sorry u minus and w plus u plus and w minus when they're plus or minus uh, their mean value, and this is from a spatial mean. Uh, so what what you can see is that in in the near neutral case that the reds and the greens tend to occur together. They tend to occur in these regions of rising motion, where the large scale rising motion is, that's all depicted by the white, and that in the regions of downwelling motion, uh, that that's largely where you see the purples and, and, and the pinks. And that speaks to the, their correlation, uh, that, you, that these are happening together, and that's why there's high correlation uh, in the near neutral case. But if we now look in free convection, where there's, uh, the large scale cells are, uh, are operating, uh, the, the hexagonal cells like this, you can see, that now, mostly in the regions of white, you see just the red, and that is the upward moving warm air. And in the center of these downwelling motions uh, is where you see uh, the uh, purples, and that's the bringing down of cool air down into uh, the canopy. Um, and th that momentum exchange is happening on the edges of these cells as these large scale cells are, that's where the shear is largest at the top of the trees. So it's actually spatially separating where the exchange is occurring, uh, the, meaning the evolution of the large scale boundary layer scales of motion are spatially segregating where the uh, exchanges of heat, moisture, and momentum are occurring uh, at the canopy interface. So uh, if we look in regions of high shear, so we take, these are two different cases. Uh, this is the near neutral case and the strongly unstable case, so there's still a slight mean wind, uh, and concatenate many structures using our same uh, pressure compositing algorithm. You can see that we see this, uh, we, we see a sloping microfront, a sweep behind a weak ejection, just like we saw uh, in the neutral case, uh, and in these regions of high shear, even in the unstable regimes like this, we see something similar, but with a stronger e emphasis on the uh, ejection phase uh, tied to uh, the buoyantly driven motions uh, transporting fluid uh, from the canopy layers outward. If we look in the free convection case and concatenate on regions of uh, where we look below downdrafts and below the updrafts, so this is in the regions of uh, convergence versus divergence of these large scale cells, we can actually look at uh, the uh, 
the average plume-like structure. So these are no longer these shear-driven eddies. These are actually buoyantly driven uh, motions that are kind of Rayleigh Bernard-like. Uh, we can get some uh, idea about their horizontal scale uh, and their vertical extent. You can see that they're impinging on this whole downwelling motion from the large-scale motion uh, in hindering their vertical extent, uh, but that in the regions below the updraft, that that's actually this coalescing of all these plumes uh, into the large-scale uh, updrafts of the boundary layer scales of motion. So from this, we are thinking that to parameterize the influence of buoyancy uh, at canopy top that we need to incorporate some percentage of plume-like structures and these shear-like structures uh, that are responsible for the exchange at the canopy top. So this might look something like a uh, stability-dependent uh, multiplier of uh, some function of this vorticity thickness idea that we did in the first place versus some equivalent one that's related to uh, a plume-like scale. We think the plumes and their scale is tied to the depth over which the uh, over which the radiation is absorbed, so over which the heating is occurring, uh, of that the canopies are imposing uh, by their canopy elements. But this is still uh, a work in progress. Uh, but this is where we are and where we think we need need to go in terms of parameterizing the influence of atmospheric stability on canopy exchange. So I just wanted to highlight one other thing that we learned from these experiments that affects the measurements a lot, and that is now we're looking at horizontal slices of leaf temperature, because now we actually, because we're solving this, this leaf energy balance at every horizontal grid point, we also know what the heat sources are spatially. So this is a horizontal slice inside the trees at 60% of the height of the tree, so up at uh, 12 meters. Uh, and what I noticed is this evidence of those large scale structures in the source distribution. So this is actually uh, important for, let's say you were, had a single tower uh, over top of the canopy and you were trying to average. I mean, this is basically a flux of heat into a volume. So it's actually one of the fluxes that you need to account for when you're, when you're integrating, uh, when your sensor is integrating uh, the turbulent exchange. This is a big piece of the puzzle that you need to actually think about averaging over boundary layer scales of motion, even though you're focusing on canopy scales of motion. If you want to get uh, the influence of the canopy sources uh, properly accounted for in your in your measurements, so uh, we can also look at statistics of uh, these sources, and you can see that um, you know. So if we look at the vertical average, so I mean, so this is inside the trees. So this is the top of the trees here. Uh, that across all all of these cases, if we normalize appropriately, that we can look at the shape of the profiles, uh, but that they don't vary too much uh, relative to uh, the imposed forcing. But that the variation, this is the spatial variation of the source distribution, can vary by order. Uh, 10 percent uh, relative to the mean for the conditions we're, we're, we're looking at here. This can be used for, uh, let's say you were interested in emissions of reactive gases uh, and that you wanted to account for the spatial variability in the emissions that if things are emitted by leaf temperature, which isoprene is one of those things, uh, that they would be emitted in regions where the leaf temperature is high uh, or more so in that region. And so you can actually try to parameterize the influence of this heterogeneous source distribution through bringing in some variability of these of of the sources and knowing their magnitude. Uh, but please uh, recognize that uh, the importance of this will vary uh, with how rapidly the leaves can respond to this uh, large scale large large scale forcing. And the other thing I wanted to point out here is if you have spatially varying sources, that there's actually additional terms in the equations that people don't think about too much, and that is the covariance of the quantity itself with its source, and so its, its likelihood of occurring at the same time at the, as that source. So this is a, there's actually additional terms that show up in the variance and the flux equations associated with a varying source uh, that we looked at a little bit in this most recent uh, paper.
So, in summary, I just wanted to say that I hope we garnered that we think it's really important the synthesis of uh, using observations and uh, turbulence resolving models uh, toward uh, improving our predictive skill. Uh, that current theories uh, generally improve the flux, you know, that we're able to improve the skill of the model using our new theory, but that it's lar largely only applicable to near neutral conditions, uh, even though we apply it across uh, a whole diurnal cycle. Uh, and that with increasing instability, the canopy scale spectral peaks, the, the actual canopy scale peak, the one associated with the canopy shear, uh, diminishes. It's not nearly as present. That length scales at the top of the top of the canopy grow with increasing instability from about three to seven h uh, times the height of the trees. So that's three to seven times the height of the trees. Uh, and that uh, momentum and scalar fluxes spatially dissociate, and that we have tried to explain that based on uh, the ABL scale structures controlling uh, where those uh, processes are occurring. Uh, and that streamwise velocity and velocity shear are strongest at the at the edges of those downwelling uh, of the downwelling plumes. So uh, you know the downwelling motions of the convective cells and how they you know where 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 those uh, uh, outward motions are occurring. That's where you would see shear largely, uh, and that we see ev evidence of these uh, double hairpin, and that's where the double hairpin like uh, structures would be responsible. F for the exchange, uh, but that in these regions of updrafts and uh, convergence and divergence where there is no shear, that it's really going to be more large scale, uh, sorry, canopy scale plume like structures that are uh, imposing and are uh, transporting material to and from uh, the, the canopy layers, and that for parameterization purposes, we need to account for uh, that partitioning. Uh, and I think I'm going to stop there. I had a couple more slides to talk about future stuff I'd like to do, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. And are there any questions, please? please uh, I'd, like to go, I'd like to go back to when you described the LES setup. You, uh -huh. you said the canopy was horizontally homogeneous? Yes. So at the two and a half meter resolution, you could actually start resolving the horizontal density variations of the canopy Absolutely. as well. So is there, a, um, is there a limit where the distance between the trees, so to say, would govern the size of the uh, thermals? Uh, absolutely. If it becomes thin enough, and, and where do you know where that different, where, where the regime change would be. We don't know where that is yet. And that was part of one of the things I wanted to talk about was sort of how, does, how do fluxes aggregate as the uh, canopies change in character uh, from a horizontally homogeneous situation like this to something more like a real ecoscape uh, of this sort, and how we might get at that with sentinet style questions. Um, so uh, absolutely a pertinent question, but we don't have that answer at this time. Any other question? Your, your free convection regime produced an, what seemed to be an open cell. Um, you know, and the updraft being at the edge of a cell and in the middle of it having yes. essentially a downdraft. Have you seen the other one? And have your simulation been able to? No. 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 So typically, we see the, uh, and we don't fully appreciate the subtleties there yet. Uh, but definitely, we see biases towards narrow, narrow bands of strong rising motion and relatively large open areas of weaker downwelling motion uh, is a pretty consistent pattern. Um, so it's more when you say closed versus open cells, that's really what is the mechanism by which the clouds are being formed. I, indeed, um, indeed. Yeah. I mean, I'm borrowing the terminology from the marine boundary layer, but uh, right. where, you know, closed is actually the cloud. <laughs> exactly. And that's why I say it's really, that's going to depend on how the cloud, what's the mechanism forming that cloud. But essentially, yeah. this is where the updraft is, whether it's at the edges or it's uh, in the middle of the cell, you yep. know, so position. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Any other question? No. Uh, so how far above the canopy do you have to go before the boundary layer forgets about the canopy structure? 
So from observational evidence, that's order, it, it ranges between two and four times the height of the trees. And that's been a quite uncertain mechanism as to why, uh, but I can suggest that I think it's tied to this differing importance between the shear dominated, shear dominated eddies that have scales on the order of twice the canopy height if they're able to penetrate all the way to the surface, and this uh, plume-like structure that you saw here that has the ability uh, and extent uh, that ranges to uh, up to order four times the height of the trees. So it's really this combination of the shear dominated versus buoyant dominated regimes, and that's why it's been this sort of thing we don't really know. We hadn't had a clear picture yet of why it is sometimes order two times the height of the trees and sometimes order three to four times the height of the trees. So it's gonna, we, we think it's tied to this change in the eddy structure uh, that's, that's responsible. So Ned, I think you've looked at this maybe a little bit, um, but how does the canopy affect like fair weather cumulus clouds and how would the clouds affect the canopy? Uh, so, this is, so I think you're asking about the shading effects uh, or part of that. I mean, so I've done a fair, I've done a little bit of work looking at clouds and their influence on shading and what that means to sensible and latent heat fluxes, uh, but without trees. Um, so that was when we were looking at uh, just simple land surfaces and really it was all, the response was terribly controlled by the soil heat flux and how much moisture was available in terms of how the actual uh, sense one latent heat fluxes imparted to the atmosphere are modulated in that response. So definitely trees are going to change that in that it's going to really be dictated by the time scale for the leaves to respond to that change in sunlight. Uh, if that happens really quickly, uh, they'll, it'll be sort of an immediate effect. If it happens that it's more like a 20 minute to a half hour kind of uh, response time, if the leaves are really slow to respond to that change, uh, then the fluxes aren't going to change so much. Um, so it really is dictated by uh, the, the canopy elements themselves uh, and how they respond to that forcing. Okay. Any other question? One last question. One more, tagging on to Don's question. So in, in essence, there would be cases where the surface layer simply doesn't exist, right? Uh, it can if the trees are tall enough. I mean, and, they'll make and, their and own. That you, I mean, there's a paradox here. You need, you, you want to resolve the boundary layer as good as possible. So you want to have grid points close to the surface, right. and there you don't have any theory which, which is valid. Uh, so we apply MO down underneath the trees, and that's even though the we lack know of it anything doesn't. else. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and it's really actually an okay assumption if you recognize that the primary uh, sink for momentum is actually the trees themselves and not the ground. Uh, and same for the sources of heat and moisture is really the trees are the dominant exchange mechanism uh, and that what happens at the surface is much less important. Um, it's not zero, but it's largely controlled by the trees. Okay, let's thank Annette one more time.